He previously served as Section Manager International Relations Policy Analysis at the South African Parliament, providing strategic management, parliamentary foreign policy formulation and monitoring and analysis services. Prior to that, he served as a uh, policy analyst at the Development Bank of Southern Africa, the DBSA, where he undertook extensive research on regional economic communities in Africa with special focus on infrastructure investment opportunities for the DBSA. He also designed and launched the, the bank's policy briefs and working paper series and represented the bank on major infrastructure projects in Africa. He also formed part of uh, the South African academic delegations at meetings of the India, Brazil, South Africa, commonly known as IPSA Dialogue Forum in 2010 in Brazil, uh, and the Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, known as BRICS summits in Beijing 2011, New Delhi 2012, and Durban 2013. For nine years prior to that, he lectured on South African foreign policy, and African International Relations at the University of the Witwatersrand. He has published widely and is a respected political analyst uh, featuring in national and international media. Our second speaker, Dr. Susan Kohler, is a postdoctoral yeah. research fellow at the Center for Africa-China Studies at the University of Johannesburg. He holds a PhD in political science from the University of Kwazulu-Natal. His research interests include China-Africa relations in the technology, media, and economic spheres, African political economy, immigration, and global politics. Um, with all introductions concluded, I uh, can now hand over to our speakers, but first let me just quickly remind everyone to please mute their microphones if they are not participating. Thank you. Okay, uh, we look forward to, you, to hearing from you um, about this topic. Thank you very much. Um, on behalf of my colleagues, and um, I'd like to uh, thank you for giving us this golden opportunity to interact with you um, and to uh, uh, lead on the discussion around the politics um, of vaccines. and. Uh, it is indeed a great pleasure. We wish you all the best um, in your endeavors uh, on these uh, uh, discussions, which are quite vital uh, at, at this stage um, in academia. We have been asked, Dr. Nkala and I have been asked uh, based on an article that we did uh, that appeared in um, Daily Maverick uh, on vaccines, uh, we have written uh, on opinion pieces and we've been working on the vaccines. However, as I had mentioned in the beginning, we look at the entire vaccine um, from a political economy uh, perspective. We have no background in the medical field and therefore we are not here to discuss anything in terms of the efficacy of the vaccines. Uh, our discussions are solely based on the politics of it um, and based on the um, our own CDC, the African Union CDC, the American CDC, China, Russia, India, uh, and all other important countries, including Lancet in terms of uh, their views on the vaccines. And therefore we have no any uh, other view. I thought I, I, I clear that because there are quite a number of people who are arguing that uh, non-medical uh, people should not venture into this. We of the view that uh, it is important, even for non-medical people, to understand that vaccines are not designed in vacuum, nor do they have uh, distributed and the manner in which the politics of it uh, take place it takes place in a context, in a global context that is uneven. Uh, secondly, it takes place uh, in a world where um, a poverty, um, particularly in the developing countries and our African continent. And therefore the COVID-19, uh, it came about in a world defined by a number of factors that I'm going to lay out uh, as an introduction and my colleague will come in. 
with some of the statistics uh, to prove our main argument that the distribution of vaccines, it's unfair. Um, it is designed in a way that uh, it caters for developed countries. Um, so all other factors are at play, including race. Um, it follows the pattern of uh, inequality at the, at the world stage. And our main argument is that the African continent should learn from this to establish its own infrastructure in vaccine manufacturing and ensure that we don't depend on external actors on issues of national continental security. And therefore the vaccine debate going forward, as we expect more pandemics to come um, after the COVID, uh, we need to, all of us to be seized on these issues, including ourselves in universities in terms of how we react to it. What are the factors that uh, define the context of the COVID-19? COVID-19 came at a time when the world was coming out of the 2008 global financial crisis. And we could see a shift from your post-1945 world order to uh, economic power shifting more to Asia and Asia led by China as the second largest economy. Number two, we also have seen that COVID-19 crisis also came at a time where in the Western world, there's a huge crisis uh, in democracy and the spread of democracy globally, uh, defined mainly by the rise of nationalism. Uh, in Europe, um, instead of integration, we've seen Britain uh, leaving the European Union. We see tensions around issues of migration and the like, and nationalism in general um, became much more stronger, uh, where the question of universal <laughs> Um, were, were being eroded. Uh, in the United States, the world number one economy, we also see tension within the United States. Um, uh, tensions and anxiety in terms of US lagging behind on a number of fronts, whether it's in technological uh, competition with China. We also have seen uh, the entire um, rust belt in the United States and the elections in the United States uh, becoming a high tension and the rise of white nationalism, right-wing politics. And that defined and brought about the phenomena of uh, Donald Trump, whose main um, elections uh, motto um, campaign was America first. So within that context, we are not surprised that the entire issue of how to deal with COVID-19 and the vaccines uh, took place in this um, poisoned global environment, poisoned in the nature that there wasn't any uh, areas of convergence uh, within multilateral structures. United States under Donald Trump uh, left um, the Paris Agreement, it left the health organization and uh, United States under Donald Trump started undermining some of the pillars of multilateralism that we understand, which are critical to both handling COVID-19 as well as dealing with its impact, the economic impact of COVID and dealing with vaccine uh, quite importantly. So therefore, this is the context in which we find ourselves in as we debate whether vaccines are being distributed fairly at a global level. Uh, the crisis continues even though Donald Trump has left the political stage in the United States. Now we are under Biden. We see a continued tension uh, that started uh, during Donald Trump uh, era, particularly tension with China and the competition between China and the United States around trade and trade wars. We in Africa, 55 countries, are not 
uh, bystanders in all these discussions and issues that are affecting the global arena. We are impacted uh, severely as we uh, have to find ways or are forced to take sides. And therefore, I'd like to invite Dr. Nkala to come in uh, specifically to deal and paint a picture of what uh, the status quo as far as the debate around the vaccine distribution and the impact it's having on the African continent. Dr. Nkala, I turn to you. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Munyai. Uh, greetings, everyone. Uh, so I'm going to I'm going to share some slides here on what I'm going to what I'm going to be talking about uh, today. Uh, so if you allow me to share my screen. Um, Uh, Dr. Nkwala, your, your microphone is muted. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, I hope I hope I'm audible now. Uh, can can you can you can you hear me, colleagues? Yes, yes go ahead. We can hear. You. Okay. Loudly. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so I'm, I'm I'm going to I'm going to paint a picture of vaccinationalism uh, within within the context of a vaccination, the global vaccination campaign uh, that started since the development of uh, the successful development of vaccines, COVID nineteen vaccines, uh, in 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 record time around uh, several countries in the world. So. Uh, more than 21 vaccines uh, uh, have, have been developed uh, in different countries. Uh, uh, this was this was a major major scientific achievement uh, because these vaccines were were developed in in one year. Uh, normally, uh, scientists say vaccines take uh, eight even to 15 years to develop. So this this was a major scientific achievement that was that was celebrated around uh, around the world. But then uh, the, the, the production now uh, and the distribution of, of vaccines uh, has, has been very problem, uh, problematic. Uh, it, it, it has perhaps been uh, the biggest uh, moral scandal uh, of, of the 21st century uh, because uh, the production and distribution of vaccines uh, have been underlined by by global uh, inequalities, uh, by uh, the national interest or geopolitical interests of, of, of the developed and powerful countries. Uh, so, so vaccine nationalism, uh, which, which we define uh, as the scramble for, for vaccines uh, and an and irrational scramble for vaccines uh, amongst different, uh, diff uh, different countries uh, with with a view to, uh, to 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 vaccinating their populations ahead of uh, ahead of populations of other countries, so it's it's a competition between countries uh, that has unfortunately been uh, been won by the powerful uh, wealthy countries in the in the West. So, vaccine nationalism has been manifested in the distribution of uh, the pre-orders uh, the pre-orders of vaccines. Are made by different gov uh, governments uh, to to vaccine manufacturers around the world. So, of, of the of the over 8.8 .8 billion uh, pre-purchased uh, COVID-19 vaccines, uh, 4.7 billion uh, has gone to high-income countries uh, in the West, uh, and, and they make up a minority. 14% uh, of of the global population has purchased. Uh, or secured purchases 
of 50% of uh, available vaccine, uh, vaccine supplies. Uh, in, in some countries, uh, as we'll see in the further slides, uh, like Canada, uh, have purchased eight times uh, their populations, eight times the amount of vaccines they, are, uh, they have purchased uh, compared to the, uh, the size of their populations. Uh, so this, this, has left, this has left poor countries uh, in, and in multilateral uh, COVAX facility, uh, they, they've been left outside the market. They've been knocked out of the market trade. Really. So this, this graph here uh, shows uh, just how unequal uh, vaccine access has been. Uh, high income countries uh, securing uh, 4.7 billion, uh, upper middle income countries, 1.5 billion uh, vaccines. Uh, lower middle income countries uh, and low income countries around 700 million. And then COVAX, uh, the World Health Organization's COVAX facility uh, has secured only uh, 1.2 billion. And then and, and the irony is that uh, COVAX is supposed to uh, cater for, for, for more than 100 countries in the world. It distributes these vaccines to, to more than 100 countries in the world. And then it, it, it has secured less vaccines uh, than say the United States, uh, the, the United Kingdom, uh, or, or, or Canada. So these, these are the inequalities uh, in the biases in the distribution of vaccines uh, in the world. Uh, the, the second graph here uh, shows the number of doses uh, per capita, the number of doses procured uh, by different countries per capita. So at the bottom, the, the bottom five, shows the countries with the, with the highest number of doses uh, procured per capita. So you can see Canada uh, is over 8 point, uh, it, it, it has uh, procured number of doses uh, per capita uh, to the value of 8.6, 8 uh, followed by the United Kingdom uh, over seven, uh, the New Zealand uh, six, uh, in, in, in Australia and in, in Chile, over, uh, over five uh, in, in terms of number of doses per capita. And the, 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 the above five countries uh, shows countries with the lowest number of doses per capita. So they, they have really barely uh, acquired any vaccines. This is the, this is the amount of uh, inequality in terms of vaccine access. So powerful countries are, are really racing forward and uh, hoarding vaccines for their, for their populations. So uh, the next slide uh, is on the vaccination campaign, uh, the number of uh, people that have been vaccinated. Uh, so this slide shows that uh, 878 million people uh, have, uh, have received uh, vaccine shots. But, but updated information as of today uh, reads that uh, it's, it's, it's now 928 million people. Uh, so that's, that's equivalent to 11% uh, of, of the global population uh, that, have, that has been vaccinated. But as with, uh, as with the vaccine uh, procurement, uh, here again, uh, some regions, some countries, are sprinting ahead of, of other countries in terms of vaccination numbers or the number of people uh, that they have managed to vaccinate uh, so far. Uh, the developing countries in the global south uh, remain uh, or trail uh, terribly behind, uh, behind the developed countries. So the, this graph here uh, shows uh, vaccination uh, Per, per 100 people by region. So we can, we can read in terms of percentages, really uh, percentages that have been vaccinated in different regions around the world. So North America is ahead with 39%. Uh, Europe uh, is on 23. Uh, South America is on 14. Uh, and, and Asia uh, is on eight. Uh, Oceania is on, is on three. And in Africa, uh, it's on 1%, uh, just, just over 
one percent of 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 the people in Africa are, have been vaccinated, uh, compared to thirty nine percent in Europe. So so the gap is really is really astounding. Uh, and 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 considering that Africa has got a population of uh, over a billion people, 1.3 billion people, that's around, I think, 16% of the population. And North America, uh, the population of uh, under, uh, North America, that's, that's the United States and in Canada, uh, a combined population of less than 500 million people. Uh, so the, 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 the mismatch, uh, the mismatch there is, is really, uh, is really astonishing. Uh, so uh, now the the lopsided vaccine can, uh, vaccination campaign, or the unequal and uneven uh, vaccination campaign, uh, it, it means that the the world won't achieve global immunity uh, anytime soon uh, because the distribution of vaccines is not efficient. Uh, it's not it's not ethical uh, it's, it's it's not moral uh, so experts uh, experts say that uh, the majority of the population majority of people in the developing world uh, will only get a vaccine uh, maybe in 2022 uh, or even 2024 so within that time uh, within that time amongst the unvaccinated uh, population uh, new virus, uh, virus mutants are likely to emerge, uh, as, as it has been the case in the UK, uh, where variants have, have emerged, even here in South Africa, where variants have, have, have emerged. And, and the problem with these new variants is that uh, they, they may, uh, they, they, they may uh, be, be resistant uh, to, to COVID-19 vaccines that have been developed so far. Uh, such as, as the case here in South Africa, where, where the government had to had to, uh, had to sell uh, the the Austra, I mean the AstraZeneca vaccines uh, that it had acquired from 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 India, uh, because they were not effective against against the variant uh, that was first uh, discovered uh, here. So 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 this this will only mean that. Uh, the, the, the unfair distribution of vaccines uh, we will only mean that the, the end of this pandemic will be delayed uh, and it's a very great uh, economic cost because the pandemic has already disrupted the global economy uh, and, and, and I think last year the global economy uh, shrunk by by three percent according to statistics from the World Bank uh, it, it might shrink even further because uh, if the world is now divided into into vaccinated uh, zones and, and unvaccinated zones, uh, it means that not everyone can participate uh, in, in, in the global economy. And if everyone is not participating in the global economy, uh, the global GDP will shrink. Uh, so vaccination, I mean, vaccinationalism uh, is, is really uh, a self-defeating exercise in the air. So uh, there has also been, uh, a failure, disappointing failure of uh, multilateralism as a result of uh, as a result of vaccine uh, vaccine greed uh, by by powerful countries. So the the, the COVID nineteen uh, vaccine global access COVAX uh, facility it was developed by World Health Organization, uh, taxed or or earmarked to ensure uh, the the fair uh, and equitable and an unjust uh, distribution of vaccines across across the world. So it's, it's a global initiative uh, that was targeting uh, the, the global, uh, the, the world as a whole. Uh, so it, it meant, uh, it, it was intended to distribute vaccines uh, proportionately uh, and, and, and fairly uh, to all countries uh, Equally, uh, so the, the first phase of of, of, of the global, uh, I mean, of the COVAX facility, was meant to at least distribute uh, distribute vaccines to each country uh, to three percent enough for three percent of the population of each country, uh, and the second phase 
uh, was meant to distribute uh, an additional additional vaccines enough to cover 20% of the population of each country. And then uh, healthcare workers and other frontline workers uh, were, were, were going to be prioritized in this, this distribution of, and the distribution of these vaccines. Uh, so COVAX uh, so far only delivered uh, 38 million doses of vaccines uh, to 100 countries around the world, uh, including 61 low-income countries. So uh, some countries, uh, so even some developed countries, uh, who who have uh, who have aggressively uh, grabbed uh, vaccines from manufacturers, have also benefited from COVID. I mean, from 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 the COVAX uh, facility as well. So the 38 million doses uh, that has been so far distributed by uh, by, by COVAX is a small fraction of of what countries like the United States and, and the UK uh, and, and Canada have, have, have secured and distributed among their population so far. Uh, so uh, another, another issue is that the, the, the facility is running short of funds. Uh, it needs $2 billion to, to reach its, its 21 target. And then uh, with the attitude that has been displayed by by developed countries, uh, they are not likely to get that money, in. and that means that means they are not likely to to meet their target, uh, the twenty one target of, of, of distributing vaccines uh, uh, across the globe to at least twenty eight. I mean, twenty percent of of population of each country in the world. Uh, so the the COVAX, uh, while it was a noble uh, idea, it has really been undermined by but by nationalism or national nationalist approaches to um, approaches to 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 to, to how uh, they deal with, with this pandemic. Uh, so uh, another problem another problem uh, facing the Covax facility uh, has been that uh, the European Union, India, and in, in the US, who are major sources of of, of vaccines, have, have imposed. Uh, Export restrictions on, on, on vaccines and then vaccine production inputs uh, on their countries and their regions. Uh, so the, the, the Serum Institute of, of, of India, uh, it was due to supply COVAX with 300 million vaccines. But since India I and mean, the Indian government has, has, has imposed export restrictions on vaccines and in vaccine inputs, uh, it, it means that. It means that COVAX uh, may no longer get access to these vaccines. And, then, and, and even countries in the developing world, uh, like South Africa, who are independently sourcing their vaccines, uh, may no longer have access uh, to vaccines from India. So that, that, that really spells uh, trouble. Uh, now, moving on to the vaccine supply chains. Uh, it, it, as we know, uh, they, they, there is a global demand for vaccines, but only only a few high-income countries uh, pro possess the capacity, the manufacturing and production capacity for uh, for, for vaccines. So the developing uh, countries depend wholly uh, on developed countries for access to vaccines, and uh, even amongst the exporters of vaccines themselves, amongst the developed countries. Uh, vaccine manufacturing uh, involves uh, a lot, a lot of inputs, a lot of interdependence. So there's a lot of trade uh, that has to go on for for vaccines to be produced. Uh, however, uh, as, as, as as Dr. Muyai touched on, the, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, disrupted the international supply chains, and and that means even uh, the products that are used to make uh, to make vaccines uh, may have been a victim of uh, those disruptions. So the next slide shows uh, shows vaccine uh, vaccine supply chains, uh, export share of different countries of, of various vaccine vaccine inputs. So it, it shows here uh, inputs or products that are used to manufacture vaccines, uh, such as your adjuvants. Uh, preservatives, uh, stabilizers, and antibiotics. Uh, 
they are they are sourced from, from very few countries around the world, uh, diverse but few countries around the world, uh, and then uh, there are products needed for for the administration of vaccines, uh, like your nickels, your syringes, uh, your 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 vials, and your stoppers. Uh, again, uh, they are sourced from different countries, but uh, mostly the, de uh, the developed countries. And then there are products that are needed for for the transportation of vaccines. Uh, again, they are they are sourced from 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 different countries. Uh, now, uh, the, the next slide shows uh, the, the global distribution of uh, COVID-19 manufacturing countries around the world. Uh, you can see North America uh, has got 32 uh, manufacturing licenses. Uh, the European Union has got 45, Asia uh, 27. Uh, Africa has got only two, Middle East one, uh, and Eastern Europe uh, one. So the manufacturing capacities or manufacturing uh, manufacturing uh, facilities are also concentrated uh, uh, in the developed world. So the, the, the problem uh, now, the problem now is with export controls. Uh, the EU, uh, the US and India, uh, which together have uh, 83 manufacturing uh, licenses. That's that's sixty five percent of manufacturing licenses uh, around the world uh, have imposed restrictions on COVID on COVID nineteen uh, vaccine exports, uh, and they, they have imposed these restrictions in order to to increase the supply of vaccines to uh, to their own populations, uh, disregarding the entire uh, the entire world. So it, it, it's it's really going to be very hard uh, and difficult for 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 COVAX, I mean for the COVAX facility in developing countries to get vaccines because we, they have really limited manufacturing capacity, uh, vaccine manufacturing capacity. Uh, in Africa, there's just two uh, vaccine production facilities. Uh, here in South Africa, there's Aspen uh, that might be producing the Johnson and Johnson facility. I mean vaccine, uh, and in Algeria. Uh, they have been licensed to produce uh, to produce uh, Sputnik V, uh, the Russian Sputnik V vaccine. So, uh, Dr. Munyai will take over from uh, uh, from this point. No. Uh, uh, thank you, thank you, Dr. Nkala. I think uh, from now onwards, it's just a conclusion. In the interest of time, I know we are pressed on time. What does all these statistics tell us? Uh, the bigger story that is emanating from this uh, discussion uh, based on our presentation uh, says a few things that are worrying that should make all of us uh, be gravely concerned. One, that the African continent is not in any position, including South Africa, to handle the vaccine uh, question in any, in any um, uh, near... Uh, excuse me, can we please mute our microphones if we're not participating? Thank you. Sorry, Dr. Wonyoy. Okay. So we have a problem that uh, only 1% uh, of Africa, and at this rate, it will take 10, 15 years for Africa to be vaccinated. And we're only talking about COVID-19. What about other uh, pandemics? We have Ebola. We have quite a lot of challenges on our own uh, continent, including some diseases that we all know that are existing, whether it's HIV AIDS um, and others, that we really need to uh, think strategically uh, how to handle pandemic in general. We have established uh, as the African continent, Africa CDC uh, recently, and our governments are collaborating. Therefore, I think there is a need to move speedily in coordinating and more importantly, and bringing more resources, uh, main power, brains, uh, as well as logistics to ensure that we have uh, uh, knowledge uh, and ability to deal with, the, with, the, with this issue. And uh, the distribution and the entire value chain in terms of manufacturing, which has already been discussed, we don't have that. Uh, given our environment, 
uh, some of these, for instance, the Pfizer to be distributed uh, in South Africa, it's only the elite um, in urban areas that are going to get access to that. In rural areas, uh, they won't because it requires 70 degrees um, Celsius in terms of, um, in terms of temperature. Um, and we don't have the infrastructure. If South Africa does not have adequate infrastructure, what more uh, the bulk of the entire continent? Most African countries don't have uh, the infrastructure to handle issues of this nature. So therefore we have a huge challenge where we call upon our governments to fund our universities appropriately and to really insist that our whole idea of looking at national security. It's not just of having men and women with guns at the border looking outside for the enemy uh, and, 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 and protecting our sovereignty. We need to have a much more broadly defined uh, I, uh, character and nature of what constitutes uh, national security. And vac uh, the question of vaccine, the question of pandemics, diseases, virus, uh, needs to be uh, really considered as national security. And we need to deal with these issues quite seriously uh, before we lose more uh, uh, people. We need also to deal with issues of ethics. How are we going to have our experts who are advising uh, our national governments that they themselves should look at and prioritize African continent they should not sit in boards of big farmers where some of the advice they give are not in line. Do not protect uh, South Africa, do not protect uh, the continent. So a number of questions that we have and we don't have answers. So with those words, I'll pause here uh, and back to you, uh, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, can I hand over to uh, Professor Fisi for his uh, discussion before I hand it over to the floor in general. Thank you, Dr. Fisi. Professor Fisi, beg your pardon. Thank you. Thank you, Hedio. Can you hear me, colleagues? Yes. Oh, all right. Thanks a lot. Uh, allow me to thank the colleagues who have uh, presented uh, and um, I just want to make some, some observations uh, based on their, on their presentation. And I just have a, a, a few, what I thought, uh, a few, you know, thought provoking questions that probably may assist us in in discussing this. Now, before I ask those questions, I just want to, to, to highlight the certain salient points that uh, the colleagues have made. And what comes out clearly uh, from the presentation is how a vaccine nationalism has resulted in inequitable the access to, to vaccines by, by, by the developed countries in general and resulting in unfair vaccine distribution. I think those points uh, come, out, come out very clearly. And uh, the loop-sided nature of the whole vaccination campaign and how the shameless and irrational hoarding of uh, of vaccines by the by the by the by the high income countries. I think those points uh, come out clearly. But I, I just want to 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 ask uh, a few questions. But even before I ask that, I wanted to make this point that um, I, I, I would have expected to see also in the presentation, you know, maybe it was because of time, the literature context. Uh, and what do I mean by that? What I mean is um, what 
literature is, exists out there on the phenomenon of vaccine nationalism, because I do not think that that is a new phenomenon. It's, a, it's an old phenomenon, it's a global phenomenon. But what has been written on or about vaccine nationalism, and um, having said that, what is novel then about um, uh, this presentation, or what is unique about this presentation, in light of the literature which, which exists on vaccine nationalism, right? And I, I also wanted to say that, uh, or let me say, I want to put it to, to colleagues here, that I'm just worried about, maybe I'll just play a devil's advocate here. I'm just worried about um, the outcry, you know, although there are genuine concerns really regarding that, but I'm just worried about this outcry against a vaccine nationalism because the assumption underlying that outcry is that high income countries or developed countries are supposed to play a pivotal role right in the realization of global health outcomes if i need to put it that way and in my opinion that outcry in a way symbolizes the epistemological dominance of the global north over the global south. And my question therefore is, should there be an outcry against vaccinationalism or we should be worried or we should be concerned about our dependence, or let me say the dependence syndrome that hounds the globe of South, or that has been hounding the globe of South for time immemorial. And uh, allow me to borrow uh, an idea from Ngok uh, Wathiong. I think we are all familiar with that, that what we really need to do is to decolonize the mind. And I think we really have to ask very tough questions about what we have to do in the global south in general and in Africa in particular when it comes to the whole issue of COVID vaccines and stuff like that. And um, against that background, what is what what should be the role of universities in Africa in the manufacturing of vaccines? What should be the role of the manufacturing industries in Africa? And I think the colleagues also made a succinct observation. They say that um, in Africa, for example, in countries like Egypt, Kenya, Morocco, and South Africa, we have very vibrant pharmaceutical industries. Now, the multi-million dollar question is, what are, what, what are we doing, right, as Africans to invest in, or let me put it this way, are we not supposed to invest in, this, in the pharmaceutical industries, which are already vibrant, as the colleagues observe, so that we, on our own, can play a significant role in the manufacturing of vaccines? in the continent, instead of just uh, crying out against uh, vaccine uh, nationalism. Now, the other question that I want to ask, which is a political uh, science question, and I want to contextualize it in the political economy of vaccines. Um, in political science, colleagues will know that we ask this question that do we have African states, or we have states in Africa. Now, when it comes to the pharmaceutical industry, the question that I want to ask is, do we have African pharmaceutical industries or we have pharmaceutical industries in Africa? 
if we have pharmaceutical industries in Africa, which are not African pharmaceutical industries, who owns them? And because ownership of those industries will have implications, of course, on whose interests that they, I mean, that which the, those industries represent. And I think these are questions which we have got to ask. Professor Ali Masru makes a very interesting observation again in a different context, which I want to contextualize. And he says that uh, the tragedy with Africa is that Africa consumes what it doesn't produce and produces what it does not consume. You will find that even in the race to find the vaccine or to manufacture the vaccine, you will find that some of the ingredients that are needed in the manufacturing of those vaccines that we are crying out against are actually coming from Africa. What are we doing on our own? Because as Mahatma Gandhi says, we've got to be the change that we want to see. So I will repeat what I said earlier on, that the whole concept of vaccine nationalism represents the epistemological dominance of the global north over the global south. And I will argue that against that background, you know, the struggle for epistemic freedom must continue, particularly in the context of global health. We cannot continue to be crybabies, you know, forever. And I, I was, as I was just making my notes on this presentation, I was asking myself, vaccine nationalism, whose vaccines are they and whose nationalism? And by asking those questions, I think we can make, you know, a critical reflection on what role should we play, or let me say, should Africa play, or the whole global South, should it play in the manufacturing of vaccines? And I think we've got tremendous potential. We've got top ranked universities in the country. We have got, I mean, and on the continent, we've got vibrant industries, like I said earlier on. Why are we lagging behind in the race for manufacturing vaccines that we need for our own population. And there's, an, there's another interesting observation which colleagues make, which is that out of all the drugs that are consumed in Africa, you will find that 99% of them are imported from outside. I saw, I read that somewhere in their, in their, in their paper. Now, what are the implications? Does it mean that we do not have the capacity? And I like what, uh, what, what, what Doc said about the whole concept of national security in terms of how we conceptualize national security, you know, by you know, focusing on guns and so forth. We need to redefine you know, the whole concept of national security. As long as we do not conceptualize it the way Prof was, was, was arguing there, we are going to be sitting here again 100 years later to talk about the same things. We really have to focus on, our, on the capacity of the pharmaceutical industries in Africa, right? To and invest in them and also invest in research and development so that as Africans or as the global South, we can be the change that we want to see. And uh, I will make, in my last two remarks by quoting from uh, Professor, Professor Mumomba. He says that um, the, the tragedy that we have in Africa is that those who have got ideas are not in power and those who are in power do not have ideas. <laughs> and, recently, and recently he was borrowing from Mahatma Gandhi and uh, he was saying that another problem is that uh, when you have an idiot in power, then you must know that those who elected him are well represented, meaning that the idiots in power would have been elected by idiots. Those are my remarks, colleagues. Thank you so much.
All right. Uh, thank you, Costa. Um, would the speakers like to respond to uh, Professor Fisi before? I know, Dr. Yes. Moon, you, you have to leave at three, but maybe Dr. Carla can then take, let's say, one round of three questions from the floor afterwards. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, firstly, would like to thank uh, uh, our colleague that has uh, um, contributed uh, immensely to uh, enrich uh, the presentation and, and give us the opportunity to discuss. We are in tandem with most uh, issues that he raised. Um, I think, let's face it, our national interest, countries always secure their interest first before they look at others. But what we are saying with the globalizing world, you cannot afford to have zones of vaccinated people and zones of non-vaccinated. Um, we are one and the global economy is one. Uh, we need to deal with these inequalities to ensure that our economy, our people, movement of people, infrastructure and everything else, it's so integrated um, and intertwined. And therefore we cannot afford uh, this kind of thinking that uh, de uh, define and, and ends within your national boundaries. Uh, we need to think much more uh, broadly when we look at national interest. And, and nationalism in itself has its own uh, problems. Um, Karl Marx calls nationalism as a, it's a false consciousness. Uh, we always think um, uh, defined by borders and, and, and that is a, it's a problem. Uh, we need to think quite seriously. But more importantly, I think we need to uh, look at how our governments fund universities. Uh, we are happy that University of Northwest will be uh, having um, uh, a medical school. That is a starting point. Uh, what will be the emphasis of the medical school? Uh, what questions, what issues that we need to cover? And at times we're not bold enough uh, we underestimate um, our brain power in terms of contributing um, in research and competing with the international community. We have a number of Africans that are in developed countries. The very same vaccines that are manufactured in South Africa, the whole testing was done on Africans, uh, South Africans. And the moment uh, the vaccines were ready, they say, well, step aside, wait, uh, we need to manufacture more uh, for the developed countries. I think we need to change. We cannot have our governments signing agreements uh, uh, and deals that does not prioritize Africans. Uh, that's one. Number two, we need also to develop conducive environment to ensure that our people do not leave their continent. Uh, our politics, our infrastructure, uh, the ability of Africans to work here. The bulk of some of these best brains that are bringing some of these vaccines are Africans themselves within the African diaspora. Therefore, we need to think quite seriously uh, as Ghana is doing, uh, opening up to the diaspora um, and to think how best we can bring um, some of African diaspora to assist uh, in funding, in establishing um, the uh, infrastructure that could deal with the issue of COVID-19 and beyond, because we expect more deadly pandemics to, to come out and our continent is vulnerable. So all what we are saying, it's all about governance. It, it's all about the serious uh, nature of our politicians and ourselves. We can't leave everything to our politicians. We as scholars also need to raise our voices and not to be silenced by the dictatorship of those in the medical field uh, that leave everything to us. You don't say anything because you don't know anything uh, about medicines. I think we have something to contribute. Uh, I leave um, my uh, colleague, Dr. Nkala, um, and Dr. Aita, who are uh, on the platform, they'll chip in as more questions from the platform and from colleagues participating, and they'll be able to answer. I thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. I, I believe that you have already answered the one question that came up in the chat function. Um, maybe I'll, I'll just 
quickly mention the other two, and then we can take questions from the floor. Um, the first one about Professor Pohu is about the mismanagement of funds uh, in, in procuring personal protection equipment. Uh, and yeah, this is a rather cynical question. Do we expect anything different with the procurement or, or accessing of vaccines? Um, will it all be above board essentially? And then from the lady, the question she asks is, what are the justifications of developed countries that they officially give uh, for hoarding uh, vaccines? And we can only take those two. Can I just say then, I think we take one more round of what, about three questions and yeah, raise your virtual hand and I will acknowledge you. And then uh, please uh, unraise your hand um, in Zoom once you have asked your question. Thank you. Okay, so Dr. Nkolo, if you could maybe respond to those first two questions. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you to, to Dr. I mean, to Professor Ovisi for, for his uh, contributions. Uh, I, I, I do share his, his frustrations with, with the outcry on vaccinationalism. And uh, it's as if we're sitting on our hands, uh, expecting our people to help us. But uh, to, come to, to, to come to the questions that have just been asked on, on, on corruption, uh, corruption is, is endemic uh, in, in Africa. And we, it's a legitimate concern uh, when it comes to vaccines. Uh, already, uh, we have seen in a number of countries in Africa, uh, COVID-19 vaccine funds uh, have, have been embezzled uh, by by government officials. Uh, people are getting getting contracts and tenders to to supply PPE uh, PPEs uh, under very uh, shady circumstances. Uh, just yesterday, I was I was watching a video clip of uh, of, of the Malawian president. Uh, he, he 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 instituted an audit into the use of COVID nineteen vaccine. Uh, I mean COVID nineteen funds, uh, and discovered that six billion uh, six billion kwacha Malawian currency uh, had gone missing. It had been misused. Uh, by government officials, and and the Labour minister was 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 also fired. Uh, the Malawian Labour minister was also fired uh, because of because of corruption. And then uh, with vaccines as well, uh, there there has been corruption even here uh, in 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 South Africa, uh, where uh, I think the first batch of vaccines uh, were meant to uh, were meant for. They were meant for health workers and frontline workers, but you would get cases where uh, people who are not frontline workers or healthcare workers uh, will maybe somehow find their way uh, to vaccination centers and get vaccinated ahead of the most uh, vulnerable people. Uh, so corruption is a really uh, big issue and then uh, the government must, must be on the watch. Uh, uh, the the media must be on the watch. The citizens uh, must be must be on the watch because it's it's very important uh, to to get rid of corruption. If 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 we have uh, if we have hopes of ever containing or ending this this pandemic, uh, and then uh, the second question is about what uh, developed countries uh, do uh, or are supposed to do uh, or Okay, now the thing with uh, the thing with developed uh, countries and their and their attitudes and then policies towards this uh, vaccine access uh, vaccine issue is that uh, well, most of the developed countries, the United States, for example, uh, the German government and, and the UK government, uh, justify their attitudes uh, on the basis that they funded uh, the research and development of vaccines. Uh, they used uh, their taxpayers' money to fund uh, the research and development process of vaccines, and and then now uh, they can only uh, prioritize their taxpayers who funded uh, who funded this uh, the development of these vaccines. That, that's 
that's uh, the justification that I've mostly seen uh, amongst uh, Western governments. Uh, but, but, but then uh, the thing now is that this pandemic is a global, uh, is a global problem, it's a global crisis. Uh, so if, if, if half of the global, I mean, half of the world is left unvaccinated, uh, as we pointed out in our presentation, new variants of these vaccines uh, will emerge. And, and it won't be long before those variants get to the other side of the globe. So vaccine nationalism and prioritizing uh, their, their populations at the expense of other, of other populations of, of the wider world uh, is, is, is counterproductive in, in, in the sense that uh, they might find themselves having to deal with the pandemic again uh, because uh, these new variants, some of them are not, uh, I mean, are resistant against, against the available vaccines. So yeah, that, that's, that's what I have to say. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, okay, we, we were over time, but, but if, if you are willing, Dr. Nkwala, can we take three questions just from the floor in general? Um, please, uh, like I said, please uh, raise your, your hand. It's under reactions in it, at the bottom of Zoom. Okay, I have uh, two, I'm looking for a third. Anyone? Okay, we can do this too then. Okay, Findili uh, Khadebe and Frank Lekoba, let's do Findili Khadebe first. The floor is yours. Okay, good afternoon. It's not Findili Khadebe, I think she used my laptop. Uh, okay, and, look over. And then uh, left there. I'm going to congratulate the speakers. <coughs> Uh, my my question will be is a straightforward, and then but I'd like also to raise uh, something. My my question is the distribution of COVID vaccine is not based on the procurement time frame, especially uh, for us in in the continent. Uh, if you procure you put a, a procurement late, you are going to get the vaccine late. You you are not going to be on the first. And one issue, but this, this is my question. Secondly, what we are observing, especially in the COVID-19, uh, on the COVID pandemic in Africa, it's lack of research center and funding. Uh, when you look, the Afri most of the African country, <laughs> we have bad infrastructure, we don't invest in research, and what do you expect from the, uh, from the advanced country to assist you. Uh, if we still continue in that kind of mentality, we still uh, be behind. The only problem, the African country we need to change and that change need now. Otherwise, still will continue coming with this kind of issue. No, African, we are still behind, we are still behind and nothing is going to change. The problem here is we change our mentality and the African continent is going to advance forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Frank, your question? Uh, thank you very much, Gideon. Uh, I think I must highlight that I'm driving, so I might have problems with this uh, connection. Uh, my, my first point I wanted to raise with Prof. Munyai is this uh, Africa CDC. I saw an article on Africa Confidential saying this uh, center is a transplant of the American center. How true is that? Because uh, what the article was saying was that the, the CDC has been used, especially under Trump administration, to undermine the multilateralism and the responsibility of, of the World Health Organization. And that's why we see even in the continent that the CDC is more uh, prominent than the, the regional office of the, of the World Health Organization uh, headed by Matsidi, my, my, uh, Dr. Matsidiso. So that is my first input I want to, uh, I would like uh, Dr. Monye to respond to. The second input was, I wanted to ask, are we talking about marketization of vaccinations here, or is this squarely and solely about vaccine nationalism? 
And if we say it's vaccine, vaccine nationalism, as pro, uh, Professor Hufis indicated, what, what context are we building here? Uh, because uh, if we listen to ourselves carefully, we are also nationalistic in our input. We are, we are speaking from our own perspective, our own interest here. Yeah. When you speak about the vaccinations and the vaccine, the whole vaccine issue, we are not uh, speaking in the global context. Uh, so uh, when you speak about uh, nationalism and we, we, we look at the factors such as marketization of vaccine, that those who have got money can be able to secure more doses than those who don't have money. So where do we draw the line there? So those are the just inputs, two inputs that I wanted to contribute here. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Kola, would you like to respond to those two questions? It seems we don't have any other questions. Okay. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you for the questions uh, and, and, and the comments. Uh, I think uh, from uh, Pindele's question, uh, it was that uh, the distribution of COVID-19 vaccines is not based on procurement timeframe. Uh, the way I understand the question uh, is that, uh, is it not the case that African countries might have uh, made their procurements uh, late? Uh, well, that, that, that might be the case, uh, but then uh, the issue uh, is that uh, the manufacturing, uh, the vaccine manufacturing capacity is limited. So you get maybe, uh, you get developed countries who may have made uh, the first move, uh, even before these vaccines were, were developed, by the way, uh, you get maybe a country like Canada making 128 million, uh, uh, I mean, purchase of 128 million vaccines. Uh, Canada is a country of 38, I think 38 million people. Uh, so they purchase uh, 128 million uh, vaccines. So, which means, uh, which means here the, the manufacturers uh, will first have to uh, produce uh, uh, Canada's orders, 128 million vaccines uh, with limited capacity. Because they have, uh, because uh, because they, they they made the first move. Uh, took, uh, the United States uh, made orders of 550 million vaccines. Yes, they they procured, uh, they made the procurement uh, first. Uh, but why the concern now is uh, buying more than more than what they need? Uh, it means the, the manufacturers will spend more time. Uh, trying to uh, fulfill their orders, the orders of the developed countries, uh, which are huge orders. Uh, and, 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 and other countries uh, will have to wait uh, longer for, for vaccines. I think that that's, that's, where, the, that's where the problem is. Uh, countries uh, making orders, uh, making more, I mean, orders of more vaccines than, than they need. So the question from uh, the question from from Frank uh, from Frank concerning the the Africa CDC being a transplant from uh, of of the American uh, Centers for Disease Control, uh, I think he raises a, a valid point uh, here. Uh, Africa has not had a, a, a continental uh, public health center. I think this is new. It was established in uh, 2016. Uh, I think it's it, 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 it's new. Uh, it's it's a step in the right direction. I, I'm not sure uh, from his question whether uh, he is implying that the Africa CTC uh, is is working with the American CTC. Or, or, or that maybe uh, Africa CTC uh, is is an imitation uh, or or evidence that maybe Africa is learning from uh, from 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 America uh, 
which, which is uh, more experienced uh, and has more expertise in, uh, in coordinating uh, public health emergency responses. Uh, and then the, the other question was, uh, was on whether here we are talking about uh, marketization uh, and of vaccine nationalism and whether Africa is not being nationalistic uh, itself uh, in calling for, in, 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 in disparaging vaccine nationalism uh, and, and in calling for, uh, for consideration of African countries in, in access. Uh, well, marketization will always be an issue because these vaccines are, are procured from profit-making uh, pharmaceutical industries. So at the end of the day, uh, it's, 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 it's their profits. Their profits are an important determinant of, of what goes on uh, in, the, in the vaccine industry, in, 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 vaccine, in vaccine access to, uh, access to other countries. Uh, but then, uh, yes, we might, there might be an element of uh, being nationalistic on our side. Uh, but then if, if, if this question is, is really uh, scrutinized from, from, well, an ethical point of view, moral point of view, uh, and, and logical point of view, it is that if, if, if Africa uh, remains unvaccinated, if Africa becomes a zone uh, of, un, of, of unvaccinated uh, people, uh, it's likely to develop, uh, or it's likely to be a fatal ground for novel uh, variants of, of the coronavirus. That may, uh, that may get or reach uh, the developed countries there. That may spread to other countries. So I, I think it's, a, it, it's, it's really a logical question. Uh, if, if you leave, uh, if you, <laughs> If you don't distribute your, your vaccines to Africa, uh, new variants are likely to, are likely to emerge uh, in Africa and they're likely to spread to your own countries. Uh, and also if, if the pandemic uh, hangs on for, uh, for a long period here in Africa, it means, uh, it means Africa won't be able to participate in the global economy. Uh, Africa is an, I think is an important uh, supplier is an important player in the global economy as well. Uh, without uh, Africa playing uh, its, its, its role uh, in the global economy, uh, the global economy will, will suffer. So I, I think, yes, there's an element of, of nationalism, but uh, it's, it's really uh, from a moral point of view uh, and from a logical point of view, it, it's self-defeating as well. Uh, for for the West uh, to to grab vaccines, uh, leaving none for the developed. I mean, for the developing the developing countries. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, we have now uh, run out of time. I would like to once again thank everyone for attending. Um, it's no use hanging, having a seminar if no one attends, and quite a number of people attended. So thank you very much. And also, uh, once again, thank you very much to the speakers and the, the discussant for availing themselves. I hope to see uh, many of you in future seminars and that all of you have a great day. So thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you, Figure. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mac.